The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. It's been a long time since I've been able to just have a day of the week where I get to open the podcast by saying it's blank day. Well, guess what, everybody? We're back with Wednesdays. It's a day, and it's DFS day. We've got the contest every Wednesday now. I think this is officially, officially official is what I'm going to, this is the tag I'm going to put on this bad boy. It's DFS day on Fantasy NBA Today. I'm Dan Baspris, and you know what that means. The great, the mighty, Mike Patria back to tell us how we screwed up last week and what we can do better going forward. (laughs) And I'm so close. Mike, I don't know if you heard me at the end of yesterday's podcast where I was like, I'm going to check the, I don't think I should check the results from last week. It's just going to make me sad. And then halfway through the show, I checked the results anyway. And it just made me sad because I was actually really, really, really close on a lower scoring week last week to actually pulling this thing off. But I missed it again. So anyway, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, yeah. I looked over your card already. And Dan, it's you're just always that, you know, one guy. And it's we're going to we're going to get this figured out. And I, you know what? I was I think I was even closer. I it can't get closer to losing. Um, I oh, was the yeah. Closest loser 21. Last I came in 21st <laughs> place. I lost by point five points, not even a full point. I, I, my guy could have sneezed near the ball and it probably could have accrued a DraftKings point. I could have. I could end up cashing, but yeah, so we're, I, we're, we're, uh, we're both looking to bounce back. JJ Barea. Now I can't. We can't pick on him because he just tore his Achilles, and so it's like you know, mocking the the. We won't speak ill of the dead, right? That's the expression there. So we won't do that with JJ. But he was obviously the reason that that you didn't win it last week because if he doesn't have four turnovers, you win. If he scores one extra bucket, if he gets one more assist, anything, anything at all, you would have actually made the cut. And I was. Uh, 44th place, which doesn't sound that close, but we had 98 out of 100 seats filled. And while you were a half point away, I was 16 points away, I think. Is that what the final number was? 15 points away? Which, I mean, that's like that's like nothing. Uh, but we're going to get into that in a second. First and foremost, uh, you can follow Mike on Twitter at Mike Apatria, A-P-O-T-R-I-A. He is our DFS expert. I was talking also on yesterday's show about how uh, you and I shared the weekly lineup show on Monday, and I don't know why it never clicked in my brain before, but as a DFS guy, weekly lineups is sort of like second nature to you because you're making this decision between which scrub gets the last spot in your weekly, and you're actually looking at their the three or four games they're playing, and you're like, okay, well, this one, check plus. They're going to have a good defense to go against. This one... The small forward on the other team is an all-world defensive player, so that's not good. This is like weekly lineup is actually right in your wheelhouse, and I never even thought about it. Yeah, you know what? And you're absolutely right. And I never even thought about it in that way, too, where you're saying check plus, check minus. But, I, you know, I, I basically do that in my head when I'm going through these uh, weekly, you know, the weekly games, the three or four games that these guys might play. And, uh, you know, maybe rating on a scale of one through five uh, when we, you know, when I hop on these shows, Uh, might give people a better understanding of, you know, if I'm rating them like a three or four DFS value play, well, that's probably a pretty good spot to stream somebody in, and it's also a plus game for that week. I might have to start calling you the DFS DFS expert and streaming apatria. We got to, like, I don't know. I'm not – I'll come up with a better nickname because, like, with with Ali, we were able to call him the team ranker because he just sort of grabbed a hold of that and it became him. And now with you, DFS is easy uh, as a nickname, but streaming. I want to get the word streaming into your nickname somewhere. So we're going we're gonna to work on that. And then I'm going to force have, you to change your we Twitter handle. We're going to go handle. on one of those, um, the nickname generators, maybe. <laughs> I want you to change your Twitter handle to streaming Apatria for a week and see, see how that works. Um, okay. So last week, and by the way, this is all in, as a preview, of course, to, to tonight's DFS Beat the Expert contest. It's going to fill up, friends and confidants here listening to the podcast. It's going to fill up. It was at 48 by 745 this morning, Pacific time. Uh, we have about six hours and 45 minutes until lineups lock as of this moment, and we're up and over 50 now. So this is officially now, I believe, the earliest we've ever gotten to the halfway point. 
It's going to hit the 100 mark. I'm fairly confident of that. If it doesn't, it'll be within one or two spots. So if you want to do the contest this week, go do it as you're listening to the podcast. Just pause what we're saying right now. Go join. The links are everywhere on Twitter. We, we send them out like every two hours and more frequently even on the day of the contest. And if you're not a huge Twitter fan, find a way to get me your email address and I can get you on the mailing list. That goes out every week, once a week, when the, when the room opens. We send out an automated mailer that just has the room information. Here's the link. You can go join it that way as well. And I know what you're thinking. How the hell am I going to get you my email address if I'm not on Twitter? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer to that question. You might have to have a friend uh, tweet it at me, or you can send it. Here's a good idea. Send it to support at hoop-ball.com with the subject line uh, email for DFS list or something like that. And, and the tech guys will make sure that gets over to me. Okay, now I've taken care of the uh, the logistical stuff, and we'll give you all the details on the contest at some point during the show, but it's the same as last week, so nothing new there. Last week, Mike, uh, you came within a half point, so we're going to talk about yours second. I came within 15 points, and in looking at my team from last week, it was pretty clear to me that there were just two things that needed to happen for my team to get up and over that hump. I needed about 10 more points out of J.J. Barea, and I needed about six more points out of Thad Young. And that was it, because everything else I did was pretty close to what I expected or maybe even a tiny bit better. I, I went high-low, as we had talked about as kind of a weird strategy, but I decided to try it out, and I went with all bargain basement guys and James Harden and Anthony Davis. And those two guys combined to get me 149 fantasy points, DFS points, between two guys. I needed like 130 out of everybody else combined, and I couldn't get it. <laughs> um, but Ed Davis worked out really well as a super cheap guy. He got 31 and a half fantasy points as, I mean, he was like, I think he was like 3,300 last week. Uh, that was a great play. Howell Neto as the third string point guard when Utah, he got his close to 20. That was basically what we were looking for there. Uh, DeAnthony Melton got 23.75. That was about what you were hoping for with his price. Evan Turner, I went super cheap there, and he got around 20, which I would have liked one or two more, but I'm not going to complain because I was shooting for around 20. But the guys that let me down were Thad Young because they got blown out by Boston, just totally run out of the building, so he didn't have a chance to play in the fourth quarter and you know get his last six or seven minutes. And J.J. Barea, who just wasn't good and was in a lot of team's lineups in DFS last week and, and kind of jettisoned a lot of them. So I feel like on the JJ front, because I think you had him in your lineup as well, as I just mentioned, uh, that one felt like a little bit of bad luck. It could have gone better for him in a nice matchup against Phoenix. The Thad Young one, you tried to warn me about it. You said, I'm going Sabonis in this game. And I said, ah, well, you know, I feel like they're both going to do okay. And I went Thad and it kicked me in the groin. Uh, what could I have done there? Do you remember the pricing enough to tell me what I could have done with that small forward spot at Thad's price that would have been less stupid? Yeah, so Thad's price on this given day, he was 5700 So I don't know the exact prices of everybody else on the slate. I can't necessarily you know, go back and look that up, but um, just looking at your lineup, you could easily slid Evan Turner over at small forward and then um, you know, used that 5,700 and had power forward and small forwards available in your player pool to choose mm. from or upgraded maybe Berea or somebody else in a different spot. But, you know, I'm looking over your lineup and it, it's, it, we call this a DFS. It's a stars and scrubs lineup. Um, you're going with stars and then you're going with scrubs to fill in your cheap spots. So your stars, um, like you said, Harden, Davis, a lot of people went that route. We had enough value on that night where it was a popular route. And they both panned out perfectly fine. They did a, they did exactly what you wanted them to do. They both hit over 70, um, and they were both under 12K on that night. So both those guys nailed it. The Ed Davis play was phenomenal. He's one guy that I believe you even mentioned earlier that day or the day before um, as one of your value guys that you're targeting. So you were all over him, and I kind of wish I listened to you a little bit because he had 16 rebounds that night. Yeah, that um, was better than I expected. I can't claim I knew that was going to happen. I thought he was going to get me 20, 23 fan DFS points, and he hit 30, 31. That made me look really smart, uh, but I wasn't expecting that good. <laughs> Hey, you know what? You're on to something, though. You th And that's the thing. We're not always expecting a guy to go out and do exactly what their numbers are. If you think they're going to have a good game, uh, that can entail anything from a 10-rebound game to a 20-rebound game. And you were right there in the middle. So I, I'll still give you your credits on that. But, All right. Thank you. Uh, 
I think this is this is overall it's a good lineup. What I would say to this, this is like a this is like the perfect definition of a cash game lineup. Um, where you only had to beat, let's say, the top 50 percentage of the field because every single play you seem to have on here just feels safe. Um, we knew Neto was going to be a guy who was going to start and get decent minutes. Uh, he's not a high usage player, but we knew he was a he was going to get minutes. Harden is just Harden. He's safe. Davis is Davis. He's safe. Um, Berea, we felt, was safe in this spot without uh, Dennis Smith Jr. Evan Turner, when he's that price tag, he's almost good for 20 points uh, every single night. And Thad Young... He was a guy you took a shot on. So you had a lot of safe plays in here. Um, you know, Melton as well, just a cheap guy that you were you you got all your floors. You got the floor games you were looking for. So this was definitely a safe lineup. And if you, you know, it had some risks in it where if you did get the ceiling game on, let's say Thad Young or Berea, where one of those guys puts up 35 or they both put up 35, we're not having this conversation. Yeah, that's true. So I'm not gonna beat myself too much about it. I I don't know. I there there was a my last second changes, my tinkering on this one was actually to take Rashawn Holmes out of it because I thought he's had too many good games in a row. He can't possibly do it again. And then he did on that night. And I don't remember what the exact number was for him, uh, but that was my other cheapo play. And I I yanked him out of it. I think if I had Rashawn Holmes instead of Evan Turner, I might have actually won money on this one. Do you remember what he scored in this on this card? I don't, like nobody oh, yeah. used him. Uh, Rashawn Holmes uh, had a, about 30 or 31 DraftKings points. And believe it or not, as low-owned as you think he would be, he is a fan favorite in our tournament. So I'm going to guess you and Brew have something to do with that. Because <laughs> um, he was 40% owned or 39% owned in this contest. And that was more than Donovan Mitchell with uh, Ricky Rubio out. You know, that was that was 2% lower than James Harden and about 27% higher than Anthony Davis's ownership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, so, we it's a it's a hoop ball contest now. If boy for shot homes thirty something percent on that's I gotta see Jonathan Isaac's next slate he's on. Yeah, it's probably not gonna be that high. The folks have <laughs> folks have soured on him a tiny bit. Okay, so you yeah. had a few lineups in this one, right? Yeah, I did two. Okay, so you had one that was twenty first, which is just like that is the ultimate groin punch <laughs> on that one. You just needed any one of your guys to do something else. And so I don't even know that we can necessarily break that one down because i mean that's that's a that's not even a coin flip that's less than that but what about the one the one that didn't work as well you had one that that was a couple points behind my lineup you were right smack in the middle of the field what can you say that was good or bad about that one so what i did on this night is anytime i'm doing two lineups especially in these contests i try to give everybody in the contest an idea of how i'm thinking on that slate regarding um studs and not using studs because that's always your first dilemma is am i playing am i paying up for a guy or am i going balanced or am i paying up for two guys and going scrubs it's so that's that's one thing i i this lineup the one that finished 49th i paid up for james harden so um i used one lineup to not pay up for a guy over 11k and then I used the other lineup to kind of go more well and balanced. So I could have even taken the route of going with two studs, but I knew that was going to be a popular route that a lot of people were going to go. So I tried to avoid that a little bit, and I just played Harden in this one. And uh, looking back on it, the only guy that really soured my grapes again was was Berea because I got my value out of Melton. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is the thing when you're when you're only playing one stud compared to two. Uh, you're you need a little bit more from these guys in that case. So I I, I got 23 from Melton. 30 would have been great. Ubre, he kind of hurt me. And what hurt me the most about Ubre, um, he only scored 21 DraftKings points, but he was 40% owned. So the fact that a lot of people had him in this lineup had him in there kind of hurt me. Um, but, you know, Collins played great, 51 DraftKings points. Bonus put up the 35 DraftKings points, even in a blowout. I got value from Gerald Green. Um, Lonzo Ball, you know, this this was the play that could have made or break me. He got 33 DraftKings points, which is, you know, smack on what I paid for, but he was only 2% owned. Hmm. Um you know what I mean? Nobody owned him. If he if he had gotten 40, 42, that would have vaulted me up. That would have put you within, I think, about nine points of uh, of cashing in, or maybe even closer than that. So, okay. Th- you know, I'm fighting this thing, Mike. Let's be honest here. I keep coming up a buck short. How am I going to get over that hump? What What should I have... I mean, I, I know you mentioned like the possibility of, of maybe taking some more chances. Is that just how it has to be when you need to get into the top 10 or top 20? You just you got to be a little bit more risky and like sort of don't care if you come in dead last. Just roll the dice. 
Well, I mean, that's how that's that's a tournament player. That's kind of my mindset a lot of the times, especially when I'm playing these large field tournaments with, like I said, forty to fifty thousand people. It's you have to separate yourself somehow. But it's also, like I said, a hundred times. You're gonna hear me say it all the time. It's evaluating and knowing the slate. So last um, last week we had so many injuries, we had so much value available that a lot of guys were chalkier plays. We knew a lot of people were gonna spend down at guard for either Berea and Melton Neto, or you're gonna spend up playing. Uh, Harden, Mitchell, Davis, like we we kind of John Collins, Sabonis, these guys were both 30 and 40% owned. A lot of guys were pretty chalky plays. So when you're playing in a tournament with 100, 100 lineups and, um, you know, there's some of these plays that are 42%, that's almost half the field. You know, half the field almost played Kelly Oubre and he only scored 21 DraftKings points. Hmm. Interesting. If you, get the, if you get a guy, you know, and that's why I always say hedge or pivot your plays sometimes. Um, if you know, if you just have that gut feeling that everybody's going to be on a guy, it's not always right to avoid the chalk. Um, you really are taking a chance, and that's the benefit of making multiple lineups. That you don't have to, you don't have to feel like a dope if you pick the wrong guy. Um, you know, you can just you know switch out Kelly Oubre in one or uh, something, you know, something like that for that scenario. But it's it's really kind of differentiating your lineups. And on that slate, it was probably a good idea to take a couple chances. I'm looking at tonight's slate. Um, we don't have a ton of value yet. Yeah. We're waiting on one large piece of news that's going to dictate the entire thing. And that's <laughs> going to determine whether or not we're going to have value. So do you still make a bunch of lineups early in the day? Or is this the kind of day where you wait a little bit and see if maybe something breaks by, say, noon Pacific time with four hours to go before lineup lock instead of like closer to seven hours where, where we're at right now? So, you know, I, I ran through, I you know, I kind of, put guys into a few spots, guys I like. Um, you know, I kind of crossed off a few guys already. But like I said, we're really, really waiting on a piece of news. Um, I'm thinking we'll have the news. It's it's the news for Marcus All. We, we need to know if he's playing or not. It's an 8 o'clock game, so it's not the first tip-off. Um, but that's going to be the most important news because if he's out, it just opens up the value to easily play a guy like James Harden or Anthony Davis and still get a couple of those other uh, mid-tier players around him. Who do you gravitate to if we if we hear Gasol is out? Jamichael Green is he the guy? I, I mean, Joakim Noah is the backup center on that team, but I can't imagine he would log more than twenty minutes. That might be all we need from Noah. Um, he's only <laughs> he's only thirty eight hundred, and if we look over his, um, I can't his believe he's that much, price. honestly. <laughs> they they priced him up. They actually priced and forced him just in case Gasol is out. So if we look over his past four games, he's played eleven minutes, fourteen, eleven, and fourteen. Um, and those yeah. games, 15 DraftKings points, 13, 12, 24. You do the math, he ends up getting double minutes. We're looking at eh, 20 to 30 DraftKings points at 3,800. Um, might be against Milwaukee, too, a pretty uh, pretty poor rebounding team. Uh, but again, Jamichael Green's probably the safer option. We just know he's getting a bump. But he's also at 4,900. I'm not going to lie to you. My first initial shell lineup right now, um, I'm, I'm tinkering with playing them both. Mmm, that was going to be my next question. So you wiped that question right off the docket. What what would stop you from playing both? Would anything like what is there a moment where you're like, well, what if this game goes sour? But maybe that's the that's the part of me that I need to eliminate, which is the you got to just roll the dice a little bit, right? If you're going to go go whole hog at that point. Well, you got to just game script it in your head as well. And that's one thing I try to do as often as possible. And we're looking at, you know, Milwaukee versus Memphis. This game can e – Milwaukee could blow out any team in the NBA pretty much. Um, and especially without Marcus Gasol, if that is the case, then it could easily get out of hand. First of all, if Marcus Gasol plays, I'm, I'm not on any of these guys. I'm probably not even touching the Memphis side of the ball. Maybe a dart throw on, um, you know, Caspi or something like that. But I'm really probably not going anywhere near them. But looking at it, you know, Jamichael Green's the backup. We're, if, if Gasol's out, we know Noah's starting. Uh, we're only looking for Noah to play 20 minutes. Um, you know, anything more is a bonus at that point. So even if a blowout, he's probably still going to get pretty close to, if not at 20 minutes. And then, you know, blowout, we're probably going to see less Jaron Jackson Jr. And we might even see Jamichael Green in garbage time anyway. So if the game stays close, we're looking at probably, um, you know, a good size boost for Jamichael Green. And if it's a blowout, he's probably still a decent size boost for Jamichael Green. Okay, I got another question for you that's more of a strategic thing, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the right way to begin constructing a lineup if you're not given a whole bunch of news, which is where we are right now. There's not a bunch of injury news out there. Do you ever go to the DraftKings lineup board and start all the way at the bottom, the $3,000 guys, and then just slowly scroll your way up the list 
trying to see how many of those insanely cheap guys you can actually get into your lineup that don't make you want to wretch. Because that's actually kind of what I did last week. And so like this week as I'm scrolling up, you mentioned Caspi. I'd, I'd throw him in just to start things off. I had success with Ed Davis last time, uh, and Houston has no one that can rebound anymore. Uh, let's see, who else is... You mentioned Joe Kim Noah, if, if Gasol is out. Andre Godala has actually been oddly decent lately. Uh, he's 3,900. So already under 4,000, I've thrown four guys into my lineup, and coming back later, maybe you, you upgrade some of those dudes. Do you ever do it that way, where you just like... You go cheapest, and you see how many of those guys you can do, and then you go all the way to the top, and you start replacing the cheap ones? Well, it's kind of like what you what you asked me, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, and it's how I generally start. And it's looking over the injury news and the spreads and the game totals. Um, it's usually the first way I go. So I, I try to get an idea of who's out that day and if anybody is going to be underpriced or if anyone's backup is going to get an immediate boost. Um it's nice to be able to pick on those guys like the Evan Turners and, you know, your Ed Davises who, you know, put up that solid production and once in a while they could have a solid, a really solid game. But I'm looking for the guy who's, you know, 3,500, 3,800 only because he's a backup. Um, you know, having mm-hmm. an extra 15 to 20 minutes to your playing time is going to be better than having a guy get a decent bump in a matchup. So looking for those guys who immediately jump right off the board, um, those are the guys I look But I usually start high. I try to figure out if I'm playing a stud, who is who is it going to be, and I try to build around them, um, because at the end of the day, that's the guy that you're trying to get the you know the most out of, and you can end up finding three, four, five, six guys from different games under 4K that you're interested in, mm-hmm. and now you you know a you can't fit them all, and b how are you going to decide between these guys if you like them all? So starting at the bottom, you're kind of leaving your player pool a little bit more open. <laughs> what about the mid-tier guys? How do you fill in that part of the... That's still the thing that gives me the most trouble. Do you mostly use the Vegas line at that point? Well, it's the good old pen and paper. It's I start off every day. I go through each position. Um, I try to target, you know, three, four, five, depending on the slate size. Guys at that position, I feel like, are in great spots who are underpriced, who, um, you know, maybe I think they're going to be low-owned or get a boost because of an injury. Um, I go through all the positions like that. And it's kind of like I said, you're going to let your lineup dictate itself. If you're playing James Harden, um, you're only going to be able to get maybe one. He's 13,000. You're only going to be able to get maybe one mid tier guy in there with him. If you, unless you're going complete, complete value, which I don't, I don't see that happening tonight. So, um, you know, if you're playing Harden, then you're not really even looking at a lot of those mid tier guys. Whereas if you're avoiding all the expensive guys, let's say, you know, Donovan Mitchell's your most expensive guy, then yeah, then now your player pool is going to be open. You might be looking at Drew Holiday, Doncic, Mike Conley, D'Angelo Russell, those other guys as well. Do you have to play James Harden tonight just because of the fact that Houston has literally no one else on the roster? Or do you have to avoid him because everybody's going to be playing him? (sighs) Make two lineups. (laughs) I'm not even going to give you an answer on that because it's it's kind of hard to avoid him at this point. You're you know, as soon as that game tips off and you see he's got 13 points in the first quarter, you're just throwing your money away at this point. I mean, <laughs> his floor right now, 13,000. We did the 5X rule. Uh, we want 65 points from him. His floor over, you know, the past five games, um, or I mean, six games has been 72 points. That's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, if he hits one of those 80, even if he gets 70, um, it's worth it. It's It's kind of hard. And, you know, you look at the guys like Giannis and Davis who – Yes, they're two thousand or twelve hundred dollars cheaper, but and they do possess the same upside. But I just feel like it's like an eighty percent chance Harden hits his, and maybe like a forty percent chance the other guys get theirs. What about the mid tier guys today? Who's jumping out at you at an at an initial glance? So you know, looking at Harden, he's a guy that in my first lineup I'll probably do two in our contest. So and I'll do one with him, I'm sure, and one without him. And if I'm playing him, we have to look at somebody on the Brooklyn side and D'Angelo Russell has just been balling out. He's 7,300. I still think it's a little underpriced. Um, earlier this year, he struggled in the matchup, but that was a game that Karis LeVert was playing, and Chris Paul was playing defense on Russell, so it's a completely different game script. Hmm. Uh, we can't really go by that, but he's definitely one guy I'm targeting. Um, looking at a lot of the guys like Drew Holiday, um, Mitchell's a little bit more, I guess, of an upper-tier guy. You wouldn't call him really mid-priced at 9,100. Um, you know, I, I got some I got some love for Clay Thompson over there. When he gets hot, I try to ride that it's not it doesn't always end well playing clay thompson or any of these guys from golden state but you know you could really cash in like i said 
avoiding chalkier plays because nobody ever plays Clay Thompson. And when he gets hot, he's hot for usually a few games in a row. How do you move guys around in your lineup if you need them to occupy a different spot? This is a total logistical thing. Do you have to take them out of your lineup and then put the other guy in and then put the first guy back in? Because like right now, I'm trying to build a lineup while we do the show. And I clicked on uh, Andre Iguodala, and he went into this shooting guard spot. But I wanted him to go into the forward spot. How do I decide that? Can I do it's, something there? Yeah, you can do that. It's, it's kind of annoying, actually. Just hit X <laughs> over uh, after you put the guy in, take him back out of your lineup. And then if you notice how on your computer, you'll see the little orange tab oh, over, the, like, over the spot. Okay. Um, if you type in a guy's name, it basically always goes through all. Um, and then it's just going to plug him in whatever the lowest open spot is. So then just click if you want him at your shooting guard spot. Click over shooting guard. Aha. Um, or start typing his name and then click shooting guard and he'll go right in there. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, I wanted to move that dude over because I'm looking at some of these other guards that are expensive. I want to throw my guards in there, and if I'm going to throw Iguodala, I want him to take up one of the forward spots. Come on, Andre. You got to go in the front court here. You got to you got to go where I need you on this one. Um, okay, Mike, uh, final thoughts on tonight's slate before we let everybody go try to build one like I'm doing and, and struggle with where they're putting Andre Iguodala. <laughs> I, definitely. Uh, you, you gotta, I think you have to play a stud. You have to determine whether you're going with the James Harden route or if you're going to go with that Golden State-New Orleans game. Um, or even that Boston Toronto game. Those are the those are the three games I'm targeting the most. And then if I'm playing anybody else, little pieces. Pay attention to Gasol's news. That's going to dictate our slate. And um, keep an eye over there on Houston. There, that's that's going to be another spot where we're going to get a lot of our value. Uh, Daniel House's two way contract ran up today, so he's back in the G League. And the Rockets decided to not renew it. And that was a guy getting 35 minutes. Mm. So they did um, they did make a signing this morning, but I highly doubt they they bring in a guy up from the G League to play the same amount of minutes. So um, Eric Gordon is back. I'm not expecting him to see a big chunk of minutes. He might not even start. So we're going to be looking at Austin Rivers, Gerald Green. Um, if James Enos gets a little bit of a minutes boost over there too, these guys are going to provide us some decent value on this slate to help us get some studs in there. Mike Apatria, at Mike Apatria on Twitter, the DFS man, streaming Mike. <laughs> I'll make it work. Thanks, my man. Yeah, if you beat me this week, that will be that will be my, uh, my Twitter... My Twitter Abby for a whole entire week. Oh, to let me I love it. All if right. You, if you beat me, you'll be streaming Mike. Wait, if you got two lineups, do I have to beat both of them or just one? If you just, uh, how about my best lineup versus your best lineup? All right, I'm only doing one. So I got to take down your top oh, team. Yeah. This is going to be tough. Hard. Yeah, I actually kind of want to make it a challenge for you. <laughs> it will be because I don't know that I've beaten your best lineup yet. <laughs> Come on, everybody help me. We gotta... uh, all right, well, fair. My worst versus your best. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, you only have to be streaming Mike for a week and then you can switch it back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. Then. Thanks for having me. And that was the great... Mike Apatria, as always, our DFS guy, who's also, by the way, fantastic weekly lineup guy. Don't know if you guys knew that. And I didn't put the connection. The The synapse didn't connect itself for me. Uh, but now it all makes sense. When you're that good at DFS, you understand matchups. And so you can just take all of those and look at Okay, I'm comparing, you know, I got this top 115 guy who's got four games this week, and I got this top 122 guy who's got four games this week. Which of these guys am I going to play? And he looks at the matchups. Okay, here's the four four games I got coming up. Which of these two guys has the better shot to have that one or two big games to go along with the generally fairly quiet ones? And that makes him a really dangerous weekly format guy. I call it getting cute when you rotate guys in and out of a lineup based on matchups because I'm not that good at it. That's why I've only won one of our DFS contests and lost all of the other ones. Mike is good at it. For him, it's not getting cute. For him, it's just Wednesday. Or Monday, I guess. If you're doing a weekly lineup or something to that effect. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what went on on uh, Tuesday evening, get you previewed for the Wednesday card, and then wrap this sucker up. It's always nice to have someone else on the show just to... I don't want to say break up the monotony, you guys listening to me. I hope I'm not monotonous. I think if I was, you'd probably have turned it off by now. But in my mind, there's a certain monotony to it. Certainly a lot of talking on my side. Phoenix and Indiana. Phoenix getting worked over in this game by the Pacers. And I have to say, as many compliments as I've paid the Suns this year, this game highlighted something that frustrated me a little bit. 
And I've said, I said some bad things about Phoenix the last couple of years. They were probably the hardest team to watch in the NBA. This year, they're not the hardest team to watch in the NBA. They've got, they've had some actually really nice stretches. I like Mikael Bridges. I like DeAnthony Melton. I love Rashawn Holmes. You guys know that. Absolutely adore him. I'm not a huge Devin Booker fan, but I understand his usefulness, and he's a very good scorer. And DeAndre Ayton, he might turn into something good. He's an efficient fantasy player so far this year, which is cool. So there's a lot of things that you can kind of enjoy about the Phoenix Suns this season. But this game upset me. And I don't know if this was the coaching staff or maybe a message from on high, but Phoenix went into play on Tuesday night at 11-33, and which is the fourth worst record in the NBA. That's an important number, remember, because it's only a semi-tank this season. The bottom three teams all have the exact same probability of getting the number one pick in the draft. And everybody wants Zion because everybody else is sort of kind of a turd by comparison. You know, it's like the LeBron draft all over again. Maybe. I don't know. It's putting a lot of pressure on the kid. But there's a seemingly a very large drop-off. You don't want to have the four spot in the lottery. You want to be in that bottom three. And Phoenix has, by all accounts, played a little bit too well lately. They've won a couple of games. They haven't been good by any stretch of the imagination, but they've also not been atrocious. They've been competitive. They beat the Nuggets mixed in there. And a couple of games, you watch them, you were like, oh, this is actually, this isn't terrible. They lost by 10 to the Mavs, and they beat the Kings, remember? They won a Two out of three there. Lost a few in a row, but they were in them. They lost the Sixers by five, the Hornets by six, Clippers by ten, Nuggets by four. They got beat up by the Warriors a little bit. They beat the Magic, remember, if you go back a week and a half, two weeks. So by all accounts, they've been improving. And in watching tonight's game, I started to get the feeling like they were starting to veer away from competitiveness in just this ball game, so I don't want to draw too many conclusions. Twice, however, in this game, the Sun starters had a negative 15, basically, plus minus. They just got blitzed by the Indiana starting five, and they sort of didn't do anything about it. They didn't make the rotations. They didn't pull them early. They didn't pull Aiton. They didn't pull Warren. They left those guys out there just to get cooked. And then, towards the end of the first quarter, Phoenix already down some 14, 15 points. Here come the reserve guys. Kelly Oubre, Rashawn Holmes, Elia Kobo. They all come storming in off the bench. And what do you know? They're a plus three. They played about seven minutes, roughly, and they were good. They were solid. They all played the Indiana bench. They shaved a little bit off the deficit. They were back within 12 or something like that, 12 to 13. It was competitive. The starters back in the ball game. That's not very many minutes for a guy like Rashawn Holmes. He's generally playing nine-minute stints. Remember, he's sitting around 18 minutes a lot of the time lately. They yanked him. Rashawn Holmes, they yanked him. They put DeAndre Ayton back in after only six and a half minutes. It was almost like, and in the first half, I thought to myself, did they just pull that dude because he was playing too well? No, that couldn't be it. Aiden had okay numbers at that point. That's why we get him back in. And then promptly the starters got waxed again. And Phoenix was back down by 15, 8. I forget what the number was exactly at halftime, but they were down by a bunch. Third quarter rolls around. Phoenix starts to get stormed again. Down 19, down 20. Uh Uh-oh, here we go. It's all falling apart. The (laughs) The pieces are coming apart for us here. Okay, let's, towards the end of the third quarter, let's see if we can't pop the reserves back in there. Oh, look at that, we're holding steady. We're holding steady. It's still only 17, 18 point game. Okay, we're at about the nine minute mark of the fourth quarter. Starters, get back in there. Boom, down another 10. Every time without fail in this ball game, that Phoenix started to hang around and maybe shave a little bit off their deficit, they went back to the guys that were getting their butts kicked. And it felt a little mavs from last year. So I'm going to pick on another team now. Remember Dallas and their tank fest last season where every time they were competitive for a few minutes, they just throw a bunch of G-leaguers into the game? 
And the only reason I bring this up is because, number one, I think that there are stretches for this Suns team where I actually am excited watching them play. I love watching Rashawn Holmes. He's just such a, he's a unique talent, especially on the defensive side, where he gets the credit he deserves now among we weirdos that watch a lot of basketball. But he does a great job of covering the roll man and the ball handler on a pick and roll. He has excellent instincts for when to back off and guard the lob and when to inch forward to try to cut off dribble penetration. He does a great job with that. And the other guys feed off of it. He's sort of the anchor on that second unit. And they feed off it. He gets them out of the break. They get easier looks. That's how they've been able to shave points off deficits. Seemingly every game Phoenix is down big early. There's nothing wrong with tanking, but I don't like the insinuation that they're not. Because this was, by all accounts, a tanked ball game. Any effort they had to get back into it, they just bailed. Immediately. Every time. And then, once the game was sufficiently out of reach, then they threw the reserves back in for the final four or five minutes, and was like, alright, well, whatever. You know, we're far enough down, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it stayed a gigantic blowout. I think, I have to go back to the plus-minus on this game, I'm pretty sure that the starters had a plus-minus of like minus 32, and the reserves were basically a break-even. Or it was close to that. So, I don't know what this means going forward. The analysis of that is, uh, I don't know. Does that Maybe that hurts a guy like Rashawn Holmes, because the team seems to play better when he's on the floor, but I wouldn't read too much into it. I think they just try to figure out when to use their guys most effectively to try to get into that bottom three. That's what I'm reading out of this. Indiana got Miles Turner back. He looked fine. 18-6, and six, two steals, two blocks. That's a big piece of your puzzle back because he was kicking butt before he got hurt. Darren Collison looked really good in this ballgame. 15 points, four boards, seven assists, three steals, couple of three-pointers. He did it efficiently as well. That's always fun. And he's been a lot better after a really bad start to the year. Top 90 over the last month, top 75 over the last couple of weeks, and number 100, right on the nose on the season. Remember when he was at like 153 and I said, it won't take that long for him to get inside the top 100. Well, here we are, right on the mark. In fact, I think once it updates for tomorrow, he'll probably be uh, inside the top 100. I'm recording this segment, by the way, uh, late on Tuesday evening. The games have gone final, but the stats pages have not yet updated. Cool beans. Thad Young, good again. All of the Indiana guys that we were complaining about have finally started to settle into their roles, and I don't know specifically why. Maybe they just needed more time to adjust, but uh, all's well. All's well in Frumpton all of a sudden. Another blowout. Philadelphia, revenge game for Jimmy Butler, but they didn't even really need Jimmy Butler because Joel Embiid had 31-13. and 13. Ben Simmons was an assist shy of a triple-double. And they just carved Minnesota to pieces. That team desperately needed Rob Covington in that ballgame. Derrick Rose, uh, he probably would have played a little bit more if it wasn't a blowout. I I still think his role is secure. I know everybody's getting ready to push the panic button on him. But he's been really efficient this year, and they need bench scoring. So I think he's okay. Dario Saric had more minutes than Taj Gibson. Some of that also was blowout-related. Taj was actually playing okay when he was on the floor And I've had to pick him up in a spot as kind of a top 125 center just to fill in some pieces. He is not exciting at all. There should be somebody else out there that would be more interesting. But if you're in a super competitive league, I could understand making that move. And Carl Anthony Towns devoured by Joel Embiid in this ballgame. That had to be a little bit upsetting, I would think. We have all these games that we get to track next time, by the way. Remember tracking all of our revenge games of teams off a 30-point loss? Phoenix off a 30-point loss, Minnesota off a 30-point loss, Denver off a 30-point loss, Miami off a 30-point loss. Four of them in one day. That's crazy. There have been a grand total of 30 of those all season coming into this evening, and then you got an extra four of them in one night. Absolutely nuts. Atlanta, A money line win for the underdog overwhelms the Oklahoma City Thunder, who, by the way, do need Nerlens Noel more than they'd let on. But this was also a game where OKC took their opponent lightly. They did not guard Atlanta well. Hawks shot 62%. That's a lack of focus on the Thunder side. And it, as I'm talking about the team right now, it makes me wonder if OKC has a really big game coming up 
not really. Lakers come into town. This felt like the weird, like, letdown or look-ahead game, but it was just sort of a game they didn't care about. It, by the way, lends itself to the credence that these guys don't care every night. And so this was a revenge game for Atlanta. They cared, and OKC didn't, and they caught him by surprise, kind of pants him a little bit. Dwayne Dedman is hoping to play on Friday. Alex Len filling in admirably. We had some Omari Spellman questions, and I said I thought he and Len would end up timesharing at center, and they basically did. Len, they played uh, Spellman, I think, at the four very briefly in this ballgame, which is why their numbers add up to more than 48 minutes between the two of them. I, I don't know how many games Alex Len can give you like this where he doesn't hurt you in, in a percentage, but if if... Well, Mar- excuse me, if Dwayne Dedman gets moved, then Alex Len is a must-own guy. The problem is, here's where we're going to run into a thing. We know, we have the burden of knowledge on this one. Here's what I mean by that. Alex Len is going to get picked up in a bunch of places because he's a fantastic streaming option right now. And then Dedman's probably going to get traded, and the guy that picked up Len to stream him is going to end up having this awesome asset that they never expected they'd have. If Len plays 25 minutes, he's going to be a very useful center for your fantasy team, provided you can deal with his not great foul shooting. It's not great. He's uh, 66% this year, 70% on his career, so maybe he can work his way back up to it. But he's giant. He's an absolute behemoth. He's 7'2", so he's just going to walk into some blocked shots. In 25 minutes, he'll block you one and a half a game probably, and that's useful. So what do you do is the question. Can you sit on a guy like this through the trade deadline, which is still three weeks away? That's a tough sell when when you're talking about the possibility that Dwayne Dedman plays most of the games between now and then. And the Hawks have, well, one, two, three, four. They still got like eight or nine games, maybe more than that. They have like 10 games between now and the deadline. So that'd be an awful lot of games to just stick Len on your bench. But there's an argument to be made to stick him on your bench and hope that he can stay healthy enough to actually play. Even behind Deadman, he was seeing around 20 minutes of ball game, and it wasn't super useful, but it was usable. The difference between useful and usable. In those games when he was playing behind Dwayne Deadman, when Deadman was healthy, he was only averaging like, eight or nine points and six rebounds, but about a blocked shot a game, which, yeah, that sucks. You're not going to want to, you're not going to want to use that in a games cap format. And you could get away with it in an unlimited games format because it's not too brutal. But what you're hoping for there is somebody gets moved and then that 20, 18 to 20 minutes becomes 24 to 28 minutes. And then you got yourself a top 90 center. Not only not higher because of the free throw number. It's with upside. If the free throw somehow climbs to like 72%, which I don't see happening, but you never know. So what do you do? Can you squat on him? I would say in a league where you desperately need a center, you almost have to. But in any other format, you wait, you hope Deadman plays a few games, and that forces the person who's streaming Len to drop him, and then you wait and you grab him, you know, two, three games before the trade deadline and squat on him from there. Because deadman has got to be getting moved. He's an expiring contract, wonderful veteran. He might get traded to Houston tomorrow, for all we know. They need a center. And big man stats are so fun and rare. I just, you just got to hope that he doesn't take too many foul shots. That's, that's the hope here. Please don't take too many foul shots, Alex Len. Is Omari Spellman a grab? Meh, no, I don't think so. Miami blown out by the Milwaukee Bucks. That was another revenge game. They went 3-1 and one again on this, but we'll talk about that at the uh, tail end of the podcast here. Justice Winslow survived. Hassan Whiteside survived, and everybody else got whipped. Derek Jones Jr. is the guy that I am still advocating a hold on. I know he only played 18 minutes and had 7-1-3 with a steal. Yes, they got clobbered in this game. By all accounts, despite getting blown out, that was actually a line that didn't kill you in fantasy sports, believe it or not. It wasn't good. It wasn't. The worst, though. Three of five shooting. He made his free throw. No turnovers. He got you a steal. I mean, honestly, he was like one defensive stat or one three-pointer away from having a decent fantasy line. So I'm I'm holding on Jones. They have to find a way to get this kid out on the floor. There's just no way that Miami can try to make a playoff push 
behind Dion Waiters. He shouldn't be getting minutes over Derek Jones Jr. There's no excuse for that. Wayne Ellington is a floor spacer who can't defend anybody, and there are plenty of teams that need a shooter coming off the bench. Just not Miami. So hopefully somebody gets shifted out there. You guys know how I feel about the clutter in the Miami Heat these days. It's just unbearable. My hatred is through the roof for this team. But at the same time, I love Derek Jones Jr. I have him in three out of my four money leagues, and I suggest you do the same and exercise patience because something good is going to come of that. It has to. He's too good to not play. The other guys, I don't know. Whatever, man. Throw him to the scrap heap. Bam, no. Whiteside's playing well these days, and he's back to making 60% of his free throws. And if he can do that, the confidence comes back. He, by all accounts, actually played an okay ball game. They just got worked by this suddenly hyper-aggressive Eric Bledsoe-led Milwaukee Bucks. They're so much better when Bledsoe's getting in on the offense. I wonder if he might have been fighting through a little injury. These guys deal with nagging injuries all the time, and it never comes out to the media, but Bledsoe looks like a totally revamped human being over his last, what is it now, three games, or is it four? Eh, three. We'll call it three. If you go four back, it was an okay game, but it wasn't great. Last three games have been great for Bledsoe. He has six three-pointers over that stretch. He's averaging 20 points, five rebounds, uh, eight, eight assists, I think, over that stretch, two and a half steals, almost a block. He's committed one turnover in his last three games combined. So he's on the move and in a good direction. That's cool. And then nothing else is really interesting with his team. Middleton is, is bouncing around. Brogdon had kind of a, I can't call it an off night. Blowouts are tough. You just you need your guy to be one of the dudes that get his gets his before the game gets out of hand. The Warriors went into Denver and said, uh, not so fast. You always wonder when that game is going to be when Golden State is like, how about we just prove that we're still better than all these other dudes? And this was the one. Golden State passes Denver for the top record in the Western Conference behind a crazy shooting exhibition. 60% against the Nuggets. 27 for Kevin Durant on 15 shots. 31 for Klay Thompson on 19 shots. 31 for Steph Curry on 18 shots. Those three guys combined to make 18 three-pointers. Kevon Looney played very well against Nikola Jokic. Held him to a 17-4-8 and game. That's a pretty good showing. Andre Godala has actually been okay lately for the Warriors in an odd twist. Draymond Green, whatever, same old stuff. For the Nuggets, uh, Malik Beasley continues to play well with Gary Harris out, and we don't know what his exact timeline is. I don't think he's going to be out too much longer. Paul Millsap still doesn't look fully healthy to me. Mason Plumlee still getting his 20 minutes. It's just too many miscellaneous pieces on that Denver team. But I think you can play Beasley until Harris comes back. That seems like more of a one-to-one correlation. And then Will Barton, his minutes are slowly on the rise. It's going to take him a bit to shake the rust off, but he put an okay fantasy line together in this game anyway. And then in Lakertown. Ah, Lakertown. JaVale McGee moved to the bench. Like, that was somehow the thing that was causing the Lakers to play down to their terrible competition. I have thoughts on this. I ranted and raved about it on the Real Big Three podcast over at In This League last night. We recorded that show with uh, with Jonas and Bogman. And what I said on that show, and I'll repeat it on this one, is I get it, Lakers. I actually get it. JaVale McGee served no purpose in this starting lineup because his job was to run the floor with LeBron and or Rondo, or whoever was running the offense at any given time, because that person understood the right time to make the pass to McGee. The guys that he's playing with right now don't. They can't figure out how to get him the ball at the right time. And so they moved him to the bench. The minutes were lower than I expected. That made me a little bit upset. But the hope here is that you get a different JaVale McGee. You get him playing more in an open court setting against... Uh, crummy players on the other team and maybe you get out on the fast break a little bit the hope I think is that a guy like Lonzo Ball could find him on a break but at the end of the day he needs someone who's a point guard that is better in the pick and roll and Lonzo isn't there yet he's a great passer he sees the floor well but nobody respects his driving ability so teams are just forcing Lonzo to take three pointers he can't get towards the lane and get the room 
or the non-room he needs. He needs to be crowded a little bit so he can throw it up to JaVale. But in the meantime, this is what we got. And we're going to have to be okay with it because, well, that's what they're trying. I'm not panicking. I wouldn't dare panic. JaVel McGee has insane center upside, as we've seen so far earlier this year when he was playing alongside healthy point guards who could get him the ball for dunks. And right now he'll get to pick on some second units, look for some decent shot blocking numbers, I would think, and let's hope that his minutes are just a little bit higher than they were in this ball game. We'll we'll see how it goes. The competition dependent, obviously, at times, and they played a Bulls team that loves to make the game slow and disgusting. And I don't know that that necessarily helps a guy like Javale, who's flying around blocking shots and what have you. But the Bulls are also terrible, and maybe that helped him a little bit. So uh, don't panic. If anything, see if you can buy low on him. Maybe somebody will drop him. I mean, he hasn't been, to me, he hasn't been that bad, but his ownership has gone down a tiny bit. And maybe you can spring him loose for, I don't know, throw a top 100 guy out there. See what you can get. He's too interesting. The shot blocking, the field goal percentage, he's too interesting. It's frustrating, but here we are. For the Bulls, uh, they're just, man, extending Jim Boylan. They're just out of their freaking minds. They're playing these awful, slow just the ugliest, worst basketball. They're this, like, regressive basketball team right now with all of these fun pieces. Lowry Markinen, Wendell Carter Jr., Chris Dunn, Zach Levine, Bobby Portis, if you want to call him interesting. He's, you know, he's a chucker off the bench, and they're just walking it up. Walk it up. Oh, boy, I hate this team. I'm a little bit worried, honestly, that... So, I remember I had that long rant earlier this year about how I've stopped expecting teams to do the the smart thing, the normal thing, and instead just dealing with what they are actually doing. And with the Bulls, they're doing the opposite. And I don't know that this necessarily has to break this year because they're, they've gone into tank mode with as many injuries as they had early in the season. They're in full tank. So why would they do something that works? So they just work on defensive principles and run half-court offense and don't have any fun until somebody breaks and loses their mind. They'll trade Robin Lopez... Keep right on going the way it is in just this god-awfully ugly thing. Uh, betting stuff. Let's talk revenge angles a little bit. 3-1 uh, and one again on Tuesday night, which is crazy. They're the last four days, basically uh, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. No, excuse me. It's the uh, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, if I'm not mistaken. What happened on the 11th? Went 4-3. and three. That was the day that had a whole bunch of them. That was a seven-play day. Went 4-3. and three. So even that was positive. That was up 0.7 units. But the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, those four days went 3-1, and 3-1. and one. No, excuse me. 3-1, and 4-1, and one, and then 3-1, and 3-1. And and That's 13-4. and four. Over the last four days on the revenge angle. It's up to a new high at 32.3 units up. Uh, at about 2.55 points against the spread. Seemingly, at least at this point of value, over 240 plays. That feels like it's actually something at this point. But we'll keep tracking. You never know. It might lose 30 units the rest of the way. And then it would be good that we tracked it the whole season. Because uh, anything can happen. And that's terrifying (laughs) let's hope not because you know i'm putting small amounts of money on this stuff i don't want it to fall apart orlando at detroit let's take a look at the wednesday card from a fantasy perspective we already broke it all down from a dfs standpoint but of course what we're looking for here uh jonathan isaac we're always on isaac watch with orlando milwaukee at memphis after blowing out miami at home they head on the road to take on the grizzlies who are flailing right now we don't know if marcus soul's playing in this ball game yet and uh We'll have to wait and see. Brooklyn, Houston. Houston, all James Harden last time out. Can Brooklyn figure out how to slow down the beard? Does anybody else get an advantage? Does Eric Gordon end up playing in this ball game? Toronto, Boston, not super interesting. Sounds like they're mostly healthy, and uh, that makes them a too many mouths to feed situation. San Antonio and Dallas, Rudy Gay, a surprise probable tag after it sounded like he was going to have basically no timetable he said oh, i'm just gonna wait until this wrist is fully healthy and then like four days later he felt fine so that was a cool and nice surprise and it's why you don't panic when guys get injury we had that long discussion on yesterday's show don't panic because good things can happen too cleveland portland 
They're terrible. Cavaliers are terrible. And uh, Portland is less terrible. We'll see how that goes. New Orleans and Golden State Warriors back home after this blowout win over the Denver Nuggets. Do you think they're going to care in this ballgame? I don't know. Utah and the Clippers. Point Donovan Mitchell. He's looked very good. And uh, that's it. We're in a weird time of the year right now because you've got all these injury subs. And that's kind of the whole story until we get right up to the trade deadline. We're about three weeks away. A little more than three weeks away. Barely more, in fact. It's 22 days. And then when we start to get closer to that, then we're going to really start to dig in on some of these potential stashes because somebody's going to be on the move. It's usually the guy we least expect, but somebody is going to be on the move. Quickly here at the end of the podcast as well, wanted to make mention of the revenge games coming up on Wednesday. There are, again, four of them. There has been almost every day over the last little bit. Milwaukee, 0-1 at Memphis. Brooklyn, 0-1 at Houston. Dallas, 0-1 against the San Antonio Spurs. And the Pelicans, 0-1 at Golden State, taking on the Warriors. We will continue to track all of these numbers, and we will continue to let you know how all of that goes. Once again, folks, uh, hop on into our DFS contest. It is awesome. It is going to fill up, so you got to get in there now before it gets full. If you wait, you will miss it. Thanks to Micah Patria for coming on the podcast. Tomorrow, solo. You'll be stuck with just me. And then Friday, live with Brewski on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Dan Vespers. Follow Mike on Twitter at Micah Patria. And follow HoopBall at HoopBallFantasy and at HoopBallTweets. Have a lovely Wednesday, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow. This has been a HoopBall presentation.